Today, we're talking about Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children. The movie and the book are vastly different. There's 109 differences, and I can't even go over that many. So I'm only going to be going over around 12, and I'll be making some extra points and trying to explain stuff. So if you want to look at the whole write-up I did, the link to where I posted it will be down in the description. But a visual representation of 109 differences between the movie and the book, it looks like that. It took me six hours to go through the movie and the book and do this. The blue is plot changes, green is object change, yellow is character change, pink is setting changes, and then there are two in here but you can't really see them. Orange, you can kind of see it up there. Orange is a major change, like it kind of affects the plot a lot, especially the second change, it really affected the plot. So I read the book and then I tried watching the movie again just to watch it through gonna get more than 40 minutes in because of the changes so I figured why don't I just figure out how many differences between the book and the movie there are and there were 109 there were so many plot changes I ran out of this blue and had to start using this light blue but then I ran out of that and had to start using this purple and then I ran out of that but there's only one of these like white ones so all of the white you see is actually uh, plot changes. I had to use a stationary set that I thought was really cute, but it's okay. Uh, there will be major spoilers ahead. So if you want to read the book, which has been out for nine years, or you want to watch the movie, which has been out for four, uh, here are the general stats for the differences, and then you should click off because I'm going to get into major spoilers. The movie is two hours long. They took out so much information and the movie was still two hours long. And the book is 349 pages. However, factor in that 61 pages are just pictures or chapter pages where it just says the name or the number of the chapter. So it's only 288 pages um, to read. There are some pictures that have words on them but they're still pictures. And the total number of differences is 109. So I did the math on that, and that means there's one difference per 2.6 pages. And if you wanna look at that in the reference of the movie, there's one difference per 1.2 minutes, which is pretty hefty, but at the same time, it's only 126 minutes, so. I didn't factor in that the last 30 minutes of the movie are just completely different. And the number of plot changes is 70. And the number of object changes was 12. This blows my mind, but we'll talk more about that later on because it's part of my points. And the number of character changes is 15. The number of setting changes is 10. I don't care too much about setting changes because it's more understandable when you're trying to make a movie. Maybe you can't get that setting. So the number of major changes is 2. And the number of questions left with observations is 46. Obviously, I'm not going to go over that many observations and questions, but I'm going to try to hit what I think is most interesting. And now, this would be the moment where you should click off if you want to watch the movie or read the book. But watch the movie before you read the book, because after I read this book, it completely ruined the movie for me. I don't think I would ever watch the movie again just because I know how much it was changed and it really just clouded my vision. And I could only see the differences. So now I'm going to get into the points I want to go over, but I'm going to take a drink of tea first. This is a really big mug, but it's because it's a microwavable rice cooker. I broke the lid though, so I can't use it as a rice cooker. So the first point I want to make is about the movie inserts this awkward scene in the beginning where this girl he has a class with comes up to his tower of adult diapers but she's with a group of guys. Jake tries saying hi to her, but she just looks at him and then ignores him and talks to the guy she's with, and they throw the adult diapers knocking down Jake's tower. In the book, Jake knocks his own tower down. This isn't a big difference, 
But it is a big difference when you factor in that these characters don't even exist in the book. I could understand if they added these characters to kind of show that he's not well liked in high school or he's awkward. Maybe even set up that he has a crush on this girl. This girl never reappears in the movie. Maybe this is to set up why he just left in the end, but I have no idea. It doesn't make sense. It's really awkward. And later on they take out characters and you could have explained that by they didn't want to confuse viewers with having to remember so many characters, but they add more characters than they take out. It makes no sense. For instance, they took out six characters, but they added like 12 characters if you count these high school kids. If you don't, then it's only eight. Another point that I want to make is that they changed objects. There were 12 object changes and it makes no sense to me. Because is it that hard to find some of these objects? For instance, instead of an apple, Jake takes a flower. You could have taken an apple. They had supper. You could still take an apple. It's so confusing. The fact that they changed a letter opener to a little two-pronged fork thing they used for meat really confuses me because it's not that hard to find a letter opener. You could go to Staples and find a letter opener. I know some of this is just nitpicky, but some object changes do make sense. For instance, they took out a topiary. It's kind of hard to get a topiary, I would assume. And instead of having actors sing, they got a Victrola to play the song. Maybe the actors couldn't sing. It just makes sense. But those are like the only two I can really think of that make sense. There is an object change that had to be made because they changed the plot. Which is why I consider that plot change a major change. In the movie, Emma has is the floaty girl. She has the anti-gravity talent. She just floats. But in the book, Emma can control fire. Like, I don't understand why they made that change. But one of the object changes is he uses a tube to breathe in the book. In the movie, she just creates an air bubble around his head or he swims into it. I don't understand. She appears so much in the movie. You could still have bonding moments with her if you just kept her talent the same. In the movie, in the beginning, um, when the exposition is still being laid, when Jake finds his grandfather and Shelly comes over with the gun, Jake sees the monster and he screams and Shelly shoots. When Jake moves his head side to side when Shelly's shooting at the monster, it doesn't make sense to me because is the monster moving side to side? Is Shelly shooting side to side? It made me laugh when I watched it, so I had to write a note that looked really dumb. And that's that. It's in the beginning. I'm guessing Terrence Stamp, the actor for Jake's grandfather, couldn't do a Polish accent. Because in the book, the grandfather has a Polish accent, so Jake's nickname is like Jakob instead of Jacob. But in the movie, Jake's grandfather calls him Tigrisku, which means little tiger in Polish. And the only reason I can think that is, is because they wanted to show that the grandfather was Polish instead of having Taryn Stamp do a Polish accent. Again, I just thought it was funny that they had to make that change because the actor, hopefully it was the actor, hopefully it wasn't a writing thing. Also to talk about Taryn Stamp, I'm not sure if it was him. He did okay in like two scenes. It could just be writing. But in the beginning, the way he acts, it's so rushed, it's unorganic. I know I sound like a snoot, but it's so bad and it's cringy and I don't understand why it was so rushed and why he just hangs up on Jake, like, don't come here, and then hangs up or like, I need my gun and hangs up. I don't remember exactly what he said. I just know it was just too fast. It was weird. So in the book, Enoch is supposed to be a little boy and the movie changed that to Enoch being a teenager just so they could have this weird romance tryst between him and Olive that's really toxic. He's super jealous, possessive. It even says in the movie, Enoch's a little possessive. But in the book, he's also mean and he's really morbid because his talent has to do with death. But I don't understand why they made this whole new romance when there's already a romance between Jake and Emma in the book. So they didn't need Enoch and Olive to be in a relationship. They're not in a relationship in the book. Fiona and Hugh have a relationship in the book and they're also a lot older. Uh, like you can see that Enoch is supposed to be a little boy. And also I want to draw attention to his homunculi. I'm scared of dolls, so I have somewhat of a bias, but this isn't that scary. These aren't that scary. It says he uses baby doll heads sometimes, 
In the movie, all he has is baby doll heads. They're creepy. Why did they make it that creepy? I know it's Tim Burton, so like, there's an excuse there. They want it to be creepy, but wow. At the end of the movie, Enoch is trying to save Olive. He's passed out, he comes to, he sees this guy trying to kill Olive. And instead of like hitting him from the back to get him off of her, he has the element of surprise. The guy thinks he's either dead or passed out. He takes the time to run over to a mechanical elephant and reanimate it. I don't get that because she looked really close to death. So they, the movie still could have had the whole pinnacle moment of him having his redemption without him having to waste time to reanimate a mechanical elephant. In the movie, the whites have peculiar powers. I think the only reason that the whites would have peculiar powers in the movie is so that there's an excuse for them to have cast Dr. Golan as a woman instead of a man, because in the book she's supposed to be a man, and whites have no peculiar powers in the book, but in the movie they all have peculiar powers. There are too many whites in the movie as well. They added four whites. There's only one in the book, so I don't know why they added more whites. This is another character ad that totally negates the fact that they took out characters. Jake has super good accuracy with the crossbow, and he doesn't have any crossbow experience, I don't think. And the movie never says that he's been hunting, so it doesn't really make sense that he has such good accuracy. Maybe it's because the target is really big, but the target's moving and it's far away. It kind of, the target becomes still a little bit, and that's when he makes his shot, so it can kind of make sense, but it's still like, I would not have trusted him with a crossbow. Later on, even, the target seems closer that he's trying to shoot. The target's not really moving. Like, maybe the target ducks, but that's the only moving that the target does. And he's horrible at using a crossbow. He keeps missing. I think it's just to create suspense, but wow, create consistency. So, back to the grandfather. There's this one scene that the movie adds that wasn't in the book where the grandfather calls the children at the home and he does this call every day and this would imply that the grandfather had left the home before the bomb hit but in the movie he leaves after the bomb hit i'm only nitpicky about it because the phone call is so cringe jake answers the phone close to the end and he lays out his whole emotion sorry if i was a disappointment to you you're the best grandfather in the world and abe is just like you know like he has really no reaction. He's just there like, what just happened? This phone call wasn't needed because later on in the movie, he gets to see his grandfather again. So I don't know why they had this phone call scene. It was just cringy. This movie likes to add really cringy scenes that don't need to be added. In the movie, it keeps making points and dropping hints that they're in the 1940s by using lingo. Like Emma says, you're not as wet as you look. And uh, Olive says, are there flying cars like in the Flash Gordon comics? I don't know why the movie keeps trying to drop hints that they're in the 1940s when the movie says the year like three times and they're all dressed like they're from the 1940s. I'm not stupid. The viewers aren't stupid. They know what year it is. It's completely possible that it's the 1940s. You don't have to drop hints that it's the 1940s. Especially when not even the book drops hints that it's the 1940s. Something I really liked about the movie actually, like better than the book, was that Miss Peregrine was portrayed excellently. The actor did an excellent job. She created a sense of wonder for the character. I don't know if that was a writing choice or if that was the actor's choice, but she did really good. Other than the photo of the twins, they're not in the book. They're only added to the movie to really create a gimmick for the trailer or make the movie seem creepier which they successfully did with Enoch's homunculi, so didn't need. I mean, it was interesting to see the twins in the movie. Their peculiarity is pretty interesting, but you can tell that they were just added to be a gimmick for the movie because their peculiarity could have been used in so many other scenes. One of the major changes from the movie and the book is that the point of the end is that they have to search for the Hollow's machine, and in the movie, they already know where the machine's at. It just falls in their lap. And that really shows that they didn't have a sequel in mind. It completely changed the plot. That's why the whole last 30 minutes are different. Not only did Tim Burton say he didn't have a sequel in mind when he made the movie, but the change of the plot just makes it impossible to make a sequel. Because there are six books they could take from, 
but now they can't really take from any of them. Yeah, Dirty D and Worm are just side characters, and for some reason the movie adds exposition to them. Like it gives us a backstory on Dirty D's rap name that isn't in the book, and then the movie doesn't explain the naming of Hollows that is in the book, so that doesn't make sense. Something else I liked in the movie is that the phone call with Dr. Golan in the movie is better than the phone call with Dr. Golan in the book, because in the book, it leaves it pretty obvious what's happening and in the movie. It's kind of like a side scene, so it's not really obvious, and I think that's better. They made such a mess in the 2016 loop that now everyone knows about Peculiar Children, everyone knows about Hollows, and this is never talked about, no consequences are shown, the only thing is shown is some forensics experts grabbing up some hollow glue and putting it in a little thing. But that's it. <laughs> it isn't talked about. That's why you think there's going to be a sequel. But obviously there isn't going to be. It's been four years and there isn't going to be. A scene that I wish was in the movie that was in the book is the scene where um, all the children are showing Jake their peculiarities by hosting their old circus show. And it shows that they used to be in a circus. And I think that was really interesting. Well, that was the video. Uh, hopefully it was okay. <laughs> I guess read the book. It's pretty interesting. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Thank you for coming for my TED Talk about Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> I also want to point out that the ending credit song for the movie is really good. Uh, it's by Florence and the Machine. It's Wish That You Were Here. And in the words of this commenter, likey likey. Thank you. But this is America. I don't, I don't.